During the Cold War, the space race prompted the U.S. and the Soviet Union to develop an astonishing array of high-end innovations that pushed technology to boundaries that had never been seen before. Russian cosmodromes constructed in the 1950s showed how far the USSR's technology had evolved since World War II had ended. The Baikonur and Placetsk cosmodromes alone have had more than 3,000 launches ever since. And on their way to orbit, Russian rockets have left more than 4,000 tons of high-tech waste scattered across miles of land where people live. The locals have grown accustomed to it. The rocket's intense red lights, the deafening roar of the launches, the small tremors, and the up to 10-meter pieces of debris that rain down upon villages and forests in the vicinity are part of their everyday life. They used to evacuate come launch time, but now some eagerly face the danger to catch riches falling from the sky. The Baikonur Cosmodrome The Altai mountain region of Asia is a mostly peaceful and quiet place. Its natural formation serves as a boundary between the Kazakh steppes, the frozen forests of Siberia, and the arid plains of Mongolia. Various landscapes, animals, and peoples interact in these lands. Civilization has never had a strong presence in the region. Nature flourished with little presence of mankind. But all that changed abruptly after the end of World War II. The USSR quickly began the construction of military facilities across its borders with other countries. In the 1950s, the once calm region gave way to the most extensive and busiest spaceport the world has ever known, the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Built in southern Kazakhstan, the Baikonur Cosmodrome has been the launch site for many historic missions. It's a monument to the USSR's achievements. Sputnik 1, the first satellite to ever reach space, and Yuri Gagarin's 1961 flight were launched from this base. Almost 70 years after its first launch, the Cosmodrome is still active. Every month, commercial, scientific, and military launches occur. The Russian facility has become the primary launch site in charge of resupplying the International Space Station. However, its tremendous importance is not without its disadvantages, especially regarding the region's population, which has been forced to adapt and make a living out of the toxic waste left by the rockets. The massive traffic of rockets that launch from the facility every month generates kilometers of debris over the corridor of rocket flight paths. Modern six-ton Russian satellites require a four-stage proton rocket that weighs nearly 700 tons. When the satellite launches, booster rockets peel away from the craft in three stages and fall back down to Earth. Those segments of debris fall violently from the sky, hitting anything under its flight path. The first stage falls within 90 kilometers of the launch pad. The second stage falls 1,000 kilometers away in the Altai region. It's been reported that some rocket parts that have rained down on villages are more than 10 meters in length. According to Russian media, the continuous flow of space debris the Cosmodrome has built up in the region since 1955 is estimated to be over 2,500 tons of waste. During the Soviet period, great efforts were made to recover the remains of the Baikonur booster rockets to preserve Soviet space program secrecy. Nowadays, the government seems not to care about them. An enormous amount of space debris has been left to rust in Kazakhstan and the Altai Mountains. Locals interviewed by foreign journalists have said that there seems to be an indirect agreement between the government and the population regarding the waste left behind. The government leaves the rubbish, and the locals get to keep the parts and scrap them for whatever use they wish to give it. Living in a Launch Zone Watching a satellite launch may be a one-time experience for most people, but it's a common sight for the natives of the launch area. The same can be said about getting accustomed to witnessing giant chunks of satellite wastes falling from the sky. Pieces of debris falling from the sky are often described by farmers, quote, like an angry red eye in the night, followed by a great thundering sound and a small earthquake that shakes the ground. Roscosmos, the Russian entity in charge of the launches, designates a specific strip of land across the area in which the rocket stages are supposed to occur. Paul Cooper, a journalist that visited the zone in 2018, explains that, quote, Residents within this zone are given 24 hours notice of a launch to get themselves to safety, and it's only outside this zone that people can claim compensation for damages. Incidents within the zone are not uncommon. In fact, they're so frequent that the Russian Federal Space Agency has an entire area dedicated to investigating claims regarding compensations for damages caused by the launches in the Baikonur Cosmodrome. After receiving a claim, the agents investigate if it's feasible to compensate for the damage caused by falling debris. Houses, animals, and people have been hit by space debris or harmed by the toxic waste left as the years have passed. In 2008, Sergei Kazantsev, a local farmer, filed a lawsuit for the death of four of his horses that died of intoxication from the traces of toxic fuel scattered through a field of his. In an interview by the Moscow Times, 
Agent Vorobyov said that he always arrives at an inspection with an open mind. He said, quote, If people have well-founded claims and have suffered physical harm, then we will look into it. But many people try to use these incidents for material gain. However, not all damages can be repaired so easily. In 2011, a Progress 44 capsule atop a Soyuz U rocket was heading to the International Space Station when it failed within the first five minutes of its launch. The rocket plummeted back down to Earth with its later stages still full of fuel. The result was a vast explosion that shattered windows up to 100 kilometers away. Luckily, no villagers were harmed, but the damage in the area was tremendous, as the toxic fuel contaminated everything around the crash zone. Plesetsk Cosmodrome The risk of falling rocket debris also exists in the area around the Plesetsk Cosmodrome, located in the Mazensky district in Arkhangelsk Oblast, northern Russia. Constructed in the 1950s as the world's first ICBM site, the Cosmodrome had more than 1,500 spacecraft launches between the 1960s and the early 2000s when the launches drastically decreased. Many of the launch boosters, fuel tanks, and fuselages from rockets dropped into the virgin forests and swamps of the Mazensky district. All that space junk has been reclaimed by nature and the people that habit the lands. In 1989, a 65-foot-long Soyuz rocket booster crashed in Mirny, 200 miles south of the Plesetsk Cosmodrome. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, just like in Baikonur, locals have made a living out of the tons of debris left by the rockets. Space Junk Scrappers The phenomenon of scrapping, or rocket recycling, remained hidden from the world until the fall of the USSR. Almost no one outside of Russia knew about this particular phenomenon that's become part of everyday life for people living near the two cosmodromes. Recently, Raffaele Petrala, an Italian freelance photographer, began documenting this phenomenon in 2017. When interviewed by the New York Times about his visits, he said, quote, My curiosity was very strong. I was fascinated by these villagers. I was interested to understand why the inhabitants of the area, despite being aware of the high toxicity of these pieces of rocket, especially the propellant heptal, highly carcinogenic, go to recover them in the tundra. Many natives have seen the launches as a unique opportunity to grow rich. A whole business has developed in the region around the debris that falls from the sky. Veteran scrap dealers track down launches with binoculars. With natural accuracy, they follow debris paths and reach the crash sites either in cars or on horses. Although it is a dangerous job, as many crash zones provoke wildfires and highly toxic vapors that impregnate the zone, in the end, it pays off. With little protective gear other than masks, the scavengers use blowtorches to strip the wrecks of their light metals and other valuables. The economic reality of the region has welcomed the scrapping business. Besides farming, hunting, or fishing, there is not much else to do. Petrala says, quote, I discovered that for the people in such an extreme territory, it is a great fortune to be able to recover these objects, to build boats and sleds, above all to be able to fish in summer and hunt in winter. The durable metal that covers the outer part of the rockets is very resistant. The space junk recovered by the scrappers is used for a variety of things. Besides hunting or fishing, farmers, for example, use the metal carcasses of rockets for building roofs and stables for their livestock, including shovels and other farming essentials. Human imagination has helped the people make the best out of the situation, However, there has been a price to pay. Devil's Bargain Rocket fuel used by Russian rockets contains highly toxic components, such as heptal, which has been linked to cancers and even birth defects. A significant amount of the debris recovered contains the remains of these harmful materials. When scrappers approach the wastes carelessly, most often than not, they come in direct contact with these materials, which directly harms them. Healthcare studies conducted in the region have shown alarming results regarding health problems. In 2005, a nature study showed children in affected areas were twice as likely to develop endocrine and blood disorders. In some locations, an elevated percentage of children are born with jaundice. Doctors explain that the spread of space junk and toxic compounds are the cause of the problem. Additionally, the waste makes its way into the food and water, damaging the entire ecosystem. Humans have found animals blinded by toxic chemicals. For a region that depends on agriculture and livestock, the effects are devastating. The Russian government has vehemently denied any link between the debris and the ongoing health problems. When asked about this, Petrala said, quote, This is another example of how the poor always get the toxic waste, and sometimes they even profit from it, but at the expense of their air, health, and longevity. <laughs>